strength like no other who reaches to me. Come on, tell Jesus tonight, you are my strength. You are my strength. Just receive it tonight. Strength like no other reaches to me, reaches to me. One more time, you are my strength. You are my strength. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Strength like no. Majesty, 
First declares your majesty. The universe it declares your majesty. majesty. You are holy. You are holy. Yes, you are holy. God of wonders. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy. The universe. It declares your majesty. You are holy. You are holy. And you are holy. God of wonders. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy. You are holy. And you are holy. The universe. It declares your majesty. You are holy. You are holy. And you are holy. Stay right there. And you are holy. And you are holy. And you are holy. And you are holy. You are holy. And you are holy. Yes, you are. You are holy. one more time, God of wonders, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, you are holy, and you are holy. The universe, it declares your majesty. You are holy, you are holy. Come on, one last time, you're holy, God of wonders. God of wonder beyond our galaxy. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy. The universe, it declares your majesty. You are holy. You are holy. And you are, you are holy. And you are, you are holy. You are. You are holy. You're holy. And the universe declares your majesty. You're holy. And you're holy. It's precious Lord, reveal your heart to me. Lord, I need you. I need you. Precious Lord, reveal your heart to me. Father, show me. Yes, show me your glory. Your glory. Your glory, your glory. Come on, just before we transition, just declare your glory, your glory. Show us, Lord, tonight. Your glory. This will forever be our prayer, Lord. Your glory. In the city of God, in your glory, sing, show me your, show me your glory. In the city of God, show me your glory. Show me, show me your glory. 
the people of God. Show me a glory. Church, can you just lift your hands? And as one body, just tell the Lord tonight, say, Jesus, show me your glory. Jesus, don't allow me to leave here the same. Jesus, in the city of God, show us your glory. One more, one more declaration. Say, Jesus, in the city of God, show us your power. Come on, now let's just take a few seconds and begin to lift up your voice. Come on, release your desire, release your hunger tonight. Come on, release it. Release your expectation tonight. Come on, just lift up your voice just for a few seconds tonight. Release your expectation in the atmosphere tonight. We want to see your glory in the city of God. We want to see your power in the city of God. Do something like never before in the city of God. Release, release your glory in the city of God, Lord. Release your power in the city of God. Let your fire fall in the city of God. We're desperate, Lord. Come on, just a few more seconds. Just lift your voice. Release your desperation tonight. Release your hunger tonight. Lord, we don't allow us to leave here the same. Don't allow us to leave here the same. Let everyone that enters the city of God never be the same. Let any, everyone that enters the city of God, let them be transformed. Let them be renewed, Lord. Show us your glory. 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 Show us your glory, Lord. Father, you have heard the cries of your people. This will forever be our cry, Lord. Show us your glory. We are people who are hungry. We are people who are thirsting for your glory, for your power to be released, Lord. Transform us and everyone that enters this place. Saturate us with your glory like never before, Lord that people will not even recognize us anymore, Lord. Let the radiance of your glory flow like a stream in this place, Lord. Let the power of your glory flow like a living river in this place, Lord. May our lives never be the same and all the lives of those that enter the city of God, may their lives never be the same, Lord. This is our heart's cry tonight, Father. Thank you, Lord. 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 You may be seated in this atmosphere. Hallelujah. 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 There's such a hunger in the atmosphere. You know, this week, um, at the beginning of the week, I just sensed that so strong. I know in my spirit, you know, I've been praying and asking God, asking the Lord to 
renew passion on the inside of me, to renew focus on the inside of me, um, you know, because I am a human being and there are times when I lose focus and there are times when I have to be reminded and there are times when I have to be recentered. There are times when I can go off axis a bit and the Lord has to bring me back to say, come back to that place of humility. Come that to that, go back to that closet. Come back to your knees again. Worship me again, not just to play a song, but don't care about whether how you sing, what n bad notes you play. Don't look around at who's around you. Come back to me. And I just felt that earlier in the week, and it's just been a cry of mine um, for the church as a whole, but me as an individual, I've just been crying saying, God, just do something in me again. I, I don't care what it looks like. It doesn't have to be what I expect. I just want you to not just use me, but I, I, I need you to fill me again, to touch me again. I need something that's private, something that's intimate, something that will sustain me. And my prayer is that for the church as well. Anytime we call upon the name of the Lord, he answers. So the Lord knows your heart. He knows your desire. He knows where your fire is. And he promises, no matter where it is, that he will increase it. If you're empty, he promises to fill you. If you're thirsty, he promises to quench your thirst. And I believe that. I believe it. I believe that tonight, and I believe it. If you have your Bibles, if you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Tonight, I want to continue what we began on this past Sunday. We've been talking about the church. I felt impressed that the Lord wanted me to teach on the church, understanding our foundation and why how critical it is and how important it is. And tonight I want to continue off of that teaching. We started at Matthew 16 and we talked about Jesus telling Peter that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And we talked about that gates of hell being the power of death. All right, Jesus was empowering Peter to reverse death all right that death would no would not have a hold upon his called out ones all right so we began that teaching about the church one of the things that i wanted to make sure um to just share with you tonight as we begin our continuation of that that i wasn't able to share on sunday it was the fact that the church in terms of understanding our foundation who we are we said we are called out ones We've been called out of death into life, all right? And we said that the power of death has no hold upon us. As Jesus rose, we also shall rise. The church is an identity. It's an identity. And I just wanted to make sure to communicate that. Again, I wasn't able to share that on Sunday. The church, it's not simply something we're called to do or go. It's an identity. Jesus is calling us into an identity. That's who we are as the church. We are being, we've been called to be. We've been called, that's called out once. So it's an identity. So when someone says, what is the church? We say, it's who I am. It's an identity, all right? So I just wanted to communicate that and share that with you tonight, all right? So again, we're going to continue our passage, and tonight, please bear with me. As we're going to look at the second part of Matthew 16, um, the second verse that we look that at, Matthew chapter 16, and let's just um, start at verse 18. Jesus here says, I tell you, 
You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you, all right, this is where we're beginning at verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I want you to read this next part with me. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, there is a ton of terminology that is here. First, the keys of the kingdom, what is Jesus talking about here? Then he uses a terminology where he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. A few things I want us to think about tonight, a few questions I want us to ask ourselves tonight, all right? What is binding? What is loosing? What does it mean to be bound? Because he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Well, that's an interesting term because what is bound in heaven? All right, I want us to look at these questions. What are the keys to the kingdom of heaven? And lastly, what I want us to also think about in regards to that term, the kingdom of heaven. Is the kingdom of heaven, when it is mentioned, is it always referring to God's domain? Or does it refer to something else? So these are the questions I want us to think about tonight as we're going to try to get through. And if we don't get through it tonight, next week, Wednesday, we will get through it, Lord willing. All right? So again, I want you to think about what is binding, what is loosing, all right? What, is, what does it mean to be bound and what does it mean to be loosed? What are the keys of the kingdom? And when the kingdom of God or of heaven is referenced to, is it always speaking about God's domain. Can I get that second microphone? So what we want to do tonight, um, we have a second microphone, um, this yellow microphone. We want tonight to be interactive. Amen. So those of you, um, I believe we are all mature believers here tonight. I believe this is the core group that normally comes. And so I want to ask if I can get a helper to just pass the microphone around. So if anybody along our teaching tonight wants to interject any thoughts, um, let me get Pastor Charles. Anybody want to interject any thoughts based on what we're speaking of or would like to uh, uh, share anything based on what we're speaking of, we want you to be able to do so. Amen? Amen. So in order to deal with or to answer these questions that I've laid out tonight, I first want to lay a foundation as to what binding and loosing is not. And in order to do that, I'm going to share with you what the, um, the general consensus has been when these terms is used. It's not a general consensus in a particular denomination. This is, if you go and research this term, or these terms, binding and loosing, if you look even in certain commentaries, you will see that, that there is an, there's a, a particular understanding as to what binding and loosing are. And I want to... Um, to communicate what each of those viewpoints are to you tonight. And then ultimately, we will explain what binding and loosing is, how, what the keys of the kingdom of heaven, what that is tonight. All right? So again, we're going to start off with our interp what the interpretations have been when it pertains to binding and loosing. All right? So I hope you're ready to take notes tonight. Number one. One of the most common interpretations of binding and loosing, how people interpret this passage with what Jesus is telling Peter, is that Jesus is giving Peter and the apostles the authority to release people from their vows. So when we look at this passage that is here, when Jesus says, that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. One interpretation, one way that people interpret this verse 
to be or to mean is that Jesus is telling Peter and telling the other apostles that you have the authority to release anyone from a vow they have made, whether they've made it prematurely, whether they made it under false pretenses, you have the authority to release them from their vows. This is one interpretation of this context. All right. Let me give you an example, an example of this. And please, you must understand that a lot of this perspective, it is coming not from an Old Testament understanding. It's not coming from uh, um, the culture of Jewish people stemming from the Old Testament. A lot of these interpretations are coming from an understanding from the rabbinic teachings, meaning hundreds of years after the New Testament was written, there was a consistent Jewish community, and this community had tons of rabbis. It is from their understanding as to how their community functioned that a lot of these uh, um, thoughts came about interpreting these passages. So when it came to binding and loosing during this time, during uh, uh, this time of these rabbis, it was not uncommon for them to release people from their oaths. It was not uncommon for them to release people from vows they've made. So based on that type of uh, uh, activity happening in their culture, today... A lot of commentators, they take that frame of thought and they try to apply it to this passage of binding and loosing in terms of you can, you can, uh, 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 um, you can bind or loose anybody from an oath that they have made. That's where it comes from. And it's very, very important to understand we're not just talking about the context in terms of how, how does this verse applied to the book or the passage. No, we're talking about understanding the culture of people. When I look around this room, each of us, we come from different walks of life. Each of us, we, we have come from different cultures. Now, what makes us unique is the fact that Though we might have grown in different cultures, it is our cultures that if we take the time to learn about from one another, it will enrich, it will help us or, or enrich our, our understanding of who we each are. If we take the time to get to learn about one another, the Bible is no different. Understanding the Jewish culture. So this was not something that was uncommon. Someone made an oath, a rabbi would release them. And so a common belief, even in modern day, is that when Jesus is telling Peter that I give you, that, that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, oh, he's referring to the apostles being able to release people from their oaths. And I want to show you a passage of scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 to 37. Matthew 5, verse 33 to 37. Did anybody want to interject any thought on that? Matthew 5, and I want us to look at verse 33 to 37. So based on our understanding, we said that one interpretation that people have had in terms of binding and loosing is that the apostles, Jesus was given the apostles to do what? To release people from their oaths or from their vows. Now, Shirley, you wanted to say something? Let, let Pastor Charles give you the microphone so that those online, um, they can participate as well or hear your thoughts. When you're saying um, release people from their oaths, um, how far reaching would that be? Would that be like marriage vows, covenants? All of that. Covenants? All, all oh, of those really? things are included. Wow. This this is actually something that's stemming even from the Old Testament. So now, I, only because I do not want to. Um, Lord help me. Let me say it this way: um, any of our Catholic brothers and sisters, 
It is not my intention. I don't want to offend anybody that previously was a Catholic or is presently a Catholic. But a lot of what we're going to examine, it is connected to Catholicism in terms of their, um, their hierarchy and how things were, were done. The, the man or the apostles having certain power and authority to do certain things. Like many of you, maybe you know, maybe you don't know. This passage of scripture here, not, not the first part, not the second part with the binding and loosing. But the aspect where Jesus tells Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, it is one of the most controversial scriptures in the Bible. This is one of, if not the main passage, one of them that Catholicism uses to say that Peter was the first pope. Because he, Jesus was making him head over the entire church. So we're not talking about if it was modern day, we're not talking about just city of God. The Pope would be head over every single church having absolute power. So many, why this verse is controversial, people use that verse to say, you see, this is the hierarchy that the church should function. Jesus himself established Peter as that. Simply because he says, they interpret on this rock, meaning Peter, I will build my church. But if you were here Sunday, we explain Peter is not the rock Jesus is talking about. That the gates of hell was a specific place in Caesarea Philippi where it is known to be said that the gods descend there. It is the realm of the dead. And Jesus was saying, I will build my church above. I will exercise authority over the realm of the dead. But, but I, 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 I'm sharing this because I think it's important when we're studying and looking at the Bible. Don't be afraid of what somebody else may think. I think it's important to know what's being said and, and now that should propel us now to look in the word of God. Can you say amen? Amen. So it goes as far back as that, Shirley. All right. And so now here's the problem. Calvin, did you want to say something? Oh, oh, wait, wait for the, um, please, please speak in the mic just so those online can hear. Thank you. Um, and Matthew, that, that's the same example. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 29. Mm-hmm. It says, uh, let me try to get my focus here. Or else, how can one in, uh, enter into a strong man's house? Oh, you, oh, you somebody stealing my notes. <laughs> you, 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 you're not going ahead of us, Calvin. Well, go ahead. <laughs> hey, man. Into a, a, a strong man's house and spoil his good, mm -hmm. except he first bind the strong man. Okay. And then he will spoil his house. We can we can we can be released from these by the only by the power of God okay. and believing in His Word. And I'll, I'll wait a minute because I got a couple more I'll share with in a few. Okay. Um, uh, um, go ahead, Demi, and then and then we'll get on. Um. So, are we sharing like what we have um, understood that passage to mean? Or yeah. I, we'll, we. We'll, what have you understood that passage to mean? Okay. Um. So I actually did a. Uh, Bible study on this. Well, not really Bible study, but I did it. Um, and when I was looking into it, I came with that um, to bind and to loose means to either forbid okay. by indisputable authority or to permit by indisputable authority. Excellent. Okay, so we so 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 we're on track. We're going to get to that. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So let's look at Matthew five, and let's look at thirty three to. 37, I want to show you something here based on that first interpretation, why it is not correct. Because in Matthew 5, 33 to 37, let's look at what Jesus tells his disciples. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Verse 34, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Either by heaven, for it is 
the throne of God or by the earth for it is his footstool or by Jerusalem for it is us uh, for it is the city of the great king. Verse 36. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make your own hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So if our first interpretation is that binding and loosing is in regards to releasing people from their oaths, that would be incorrect because according to this passage, Jesus teaches his disciples, don't take any oaths. Don't swear any oaths at all. So just by this context alone, we understand that that interpretation cannot be correct. So binding and loosing cannot be releasing someone from their oath. Can you say amen? Amen. It's okay, I don't have to look so serious. You guys can smile. Hallelujah. Now, there's another part of this also we want, I also want to share with you when we're talking about releasing oaths. If that was the case, do you know what Jesus would be telling Peter and the, and the other apostles? That you guys have the power to decide what is a good oath and what is a bad one? That's what that would mean. If that's what binding and loosing was. Now, again, I made a statement earlier. Don't want to offend anyone. But as we're going through this, maybe some of us have been there. Maybe we know somebody who's been there. Maybe we don't. But one of the things that I've come to see, especially in studying the church, is it is the, the lust of power. And I have seen it operating, not in this church, but unfortunately, throughout my time as a believer, I have seen it. Where believers... Do not because they don't understand their identity. And as a result of not understanding their identity, their life is tossed to and fro because their very existence depends on the word of someone else that comes from someone else's mouth. In other words, people have not been trained to know Jesus for themselves. For some, not all, but there are some, they only know Jesus based out of the mouth of someone else. And that's as far as it will go for them. And the truth is, to be a follower of Jesus, he does not call you and I to know him by someone else's declaration. He calls us individually to have a personal experience and encounter with him. I want us to, to, to remember that. So again here, we said that the first interpretation, it cannot be correct. That binding and loosing means to release people from their oaths because Jesus here tells his disciples, don't take any oaths. All right, let's get to interpretation number two. Interpretation number two is that binding and loosing, it refers to the apostles having the authority to tell people what activities or behaviors that they can do or cannot do. Remember, I mentioned that the lust of power. So if we interpret this passage of scripture to mean of binding and loosing, if we say that, well, binding and loosing is Jesus giving Peter and the apostles authority to essentially tell people what behaviors are correct and wrong and what activities they are to do and cannot do, that that is what it refers to binding and loosing, then, beloved, we are in trouble. As I shared with you earlier, for me, as I'm studying these passages, all types of memories were coming to mind. 
Not all of them were personal, but some of them were from people that I know. I have seen people under the power that to make a basic decision they will not do unless they hear it from a specific individual's mouth. And that same system is how some interpret this verse to me. Binding and loosing is the apostles or the, at this time, the disciples, and even you can go to the extent it's church leaders in this context having the authority by Jesus to tell people how they are to behave, what behavior is good, what behavior is bad, and what activities they are to, what activities are good or bad and they are to participate or not participate in. That's the second interpretation of this scripture. Now, let's look a little further into that. What exactly does that mean? That the apostles would have authority to tell people what behaviors or activities they can or cannot do. Essentially, what's being taught here is that by this interpretation, this makes the apostles to be interpreters of the scriptures. In other words, when there's a difference of opinion somewhere, when there's a specific situation or, or matter that requires a, 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 a teaching or, or anything pertaining to the law in this case, the apostles were the ones who would go and investigate it and they would decide, they would decide if it was to be followed or not. I'm going to explain that a little bit further. Ultimately, that type of belief is saying that only the apostles can interpret the law. And if only they can interpret the law, then that means they can dictate what is good, what is bad. Does that make sense? Now, here's the problem with that. By interpreting, if this understanding of binding and loosing means that the apostles now can interpret the law and in interpreting the law they can now tell people what is good what is acceptable behavior if they can now do this what that makes them is in those days what would be called a rabbi a rabbi is what you call a teacher watch this the problem with that is that Jesus says something about it. Jesus tells his disciples that none of you are to call yourselves rabbi. And I'm going to explain something here in this scripture. I want you to see something with me. Look at Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 23 and look at verse 8. This understanding says that the apostles, they can interpret the law. They can approve or disapprove of what is acceptable behavior or not. Why? Because Jesus has given them the authority to interpret the scripture, thus dictating how people should or should not live. Here's the problem with that understanding there. Matthew chapter 23. And let's look at verse 8. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 8. Look at what Jesus himself says here. But you are not to be called rabbi. Can you see that? For you have five teachers. You have ten teachers. So we're all reading the same Bible here. He says you only have one teacher. Watch, watch this. And you are all brothers watch this you only have one teacher and you are all brothers you are not to be called rabbis now we're going to add another verse to this that's directly connected to this look at Matthew chapter 5 and let's look at verse 17 to 19 that's going to make this passage make sense why Jesus is saying you're not to be called rabbis. You're to see one another as brothers. You're not to be called teachers. You're to see one another as brothers. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 19. 
This is what the scripture here says. Jesus says here, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. That fulfilling, I've come to complete them, to obey them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Verse 19, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, watch this, and teaches others to do the same will be called in the least of the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them, and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' emphasis is that his disciples should not be called rabbis because rabbis are those who only teach and don't practice. In Matthew 5, in these two verses, he says, anyone who teaches one of these little ones to do opposite of what the law says, that person is condemned. Notice, anyone who, 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 who tells or teaches them, but he said, but the one who teaches one of these little ones, who does, who demonstrates, not only by word, but by action. That's what he's emphasizing here. Don't call yourself teachers. Don't tell people of the word, obey it. And he uses himself. I came not to destroy, but I came to fulfill. I came to obey. So you as my disciples are to obey. Does that make sense? Does anybody want to interject anything there? Um, Calvin. And in the, the same setting is because the, as, as, as I was studying here, it says that, the, you know, whenever you're, you're held under the obligations of the law, you can never be delivered from sins anyway because it takes Absolutely. Jesus to deliver us from it. Absolutely. And actually, Paul, Paul, when he talks about the law, I love his analogy when he talks about the law. Paul says the law, it was just a guardian. Before we came to Jesus, we were not a part of the family of God, so we were orphans. So Paul says the law was just a guardian. But now that Christ has pulled us from death into life. Now that we are part of the family of God, we are no longer orphans. We've been adopted now. So therefore, there's no need for a guardian. We're not under the power of a guardian, a.k.a. the law anymore. We are now under the power of Jesus, under the law of grace. Hallelujah. So Jesus' emphasis, he uses himself. First he says, he says, I came to obey the law. And he emphasizes that his, that his disciples, that they obeyed the law, not the interpretation of it. And that they teach others to obey. Not to be fixated on the interpretation of the law, but rather to obey the law. And we have all been there. We've all experienced, we've all seen. It is not about who can quote the Bible. What good is quoting the scriptures if we're not obedient to them? Even the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. God looks at obedience. This is from the very beginning. Even in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, there was no law. The only thing that existed in the garden was obedience and disobedience. Ed, you wanted to say something? Um, the problem with the law has always been it ties the works, what I can do. Jesus obeyed the law. And it's grace... It's what Jesus did. Absolutely. No longer what I can do, but Jesus did. Absolutely. Excellent point, Ed. Does somebody else want to interject something? All right. Hallelujah. All right. So Jesus' emphasis was that his disciples should not be called rabbis. 
Don't become so consumed in interpreting the law, now dictating how other people should live. No, you individually obey the law. Control how you live in obedience to it. And then he says, look at me. I'm the example. I came to fulfill it. Hallelujah. Let's go to the third interpretation. The third interpretation when we're talking about what is binding and loosing. Third interpretation says that binding and loosing, it is in reference to the authority that Jesus is given to church leaders in terms of church discipline. Binding and loosing. The church, so what that simply means is that some will interpret that passage to mean that the church decides who stays within its communities or the church can excommunicate whomever it decides to from out of its community. That's the third interpretation, that the church has the authority from Jesus to decide who will be a part of its body and who will not. And they can excommunicate anyone they decide to excommunicate or bring anyone within the body that they decide to bring within the body. Binding and loosing, that is the third interpretation. So people believe that the church was given the authority to ban anyone they want to ban. Now, just on a very simplistic level, remember I shared with you earlier, church, the church is an identity. How can you ban someone from who God has called them to be? Even a disobedient son if that child is so disobedient that the parents put that child out, even though the parents put that child out, that child will never stop being a child to that parent. Because sonship is an identity. The church is an identity. So how can you ban an identity? So when we look at this third interpretation here, that the church can excommunicate or, or ban whomever it decides or bring in whomever it decides, it's a dangerous, it, it's dangerous. And I'm going to explain that to you. Calvin, you wanted to say something? <laughs> say yes, Lord. I agree with that because if, if that was the case, then the woman at the well, Jesus, would have banded her. Okay. And every one of us have to look at her and say, Lord Jesus, I'm grateful okay. that I, I, you know, I feel myself in the same situation because if it was not for Jesus, then what would we do? Okay. That's the question. Because if we'll go around and say everybody else has got a fault and we are perfect, then yeah. something is wrong. Actually, um, I, I, I think that's an excellent point you make, Calvin. Um, re re remember that because... One of our interpretations we're going to get into is going to deal with that. It's not this one, but what you just said, one of our interpretations, I mean, when I tell you, it's just so dangerous because if we, if we don't understand not what the church is, but who the church is, we're going to continue in a cycle that will outlast us. It will pass to our children, and then they will teach their children the exact same thing. And over generations, the identity of the church will be lost. Its name will be stripped. Its identity, that's what it means. When a name is stripped, it represents name, represents identity. That's where we're on the verge of. That's why I cannot just be simply happy with saying I go to church. I must not be happy with anyone else who embraces that type of mindset to say, well, I just go to church. Church is an identity. 
And it is one that as we're learning and as we receive it, that we must covet it, protect it. We must mature in it. We must mature in it. So when we're talking about that third interpretation, that it, it references, binding and loosing references to church discipline. Now, what do you mean by church discipline? Remember, we said that the church, this interpretation says the church has the, has the authority from Jesus to ban or excommunicate whomever it decides to. Now, one example I want to look at when it comes to that banning and excommunicating, why it's, it's dangerous, especially in the context I'm going to show you. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's, it's a short chapter, so we'll just read it. But when you, Paul deals with this issue, but he doesn't generalize banning or excommunicating. He specifically sets a standard that the church in this specific, the church at Corinth, they were a very carnal church. So he, he, he sets guidelines here as to what happens or, or what it looks like, what it takes for a believer to be excommunicated from. What that actually looks like here. And you'll see it in 1 Corinthians chapters 5. Let's, let's look at the whole chapter. Beginning at verse 1. Paul says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And of a kind that is not tolerated. Even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Now, you're going to see here, as we're going to read, Paul is not saying, I mean, this is, you're talking about someone within the church was sleeping, all right, with their father's wife. So in this case, this would be their mother. What Paul is describing here, it is not someone sinned and all oh, they messed up. No, this is unconfessed unrepentant sin being allowed to happen within the body. Paul says you have to remove it. Why? Because ultimately it will contaminate the entire body. If, if that type of sin, unrepentant, is allowed to be practiced, so we're not talking about something that happened once or, or, or and the person repented and, and the church restored them. Paul is talking about someone who's openly living that way and, and fellowshipping among believers. He says, put them out. Let's continue to read. He says, let him who has done this be removed from you. Verse 3. For though absent in body, he says, I'm present in spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, once again, here's that terminology. Paul says, turn him over to Satan. What does that mean? Believers back then, in Paul's time, they understood this language. This was not something that was just, well, I'm, 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 I'm sinning in the church and, you know, it, it is what it is. Whoever don't like me doesn't like me. No, because for a believer, the church was their life source. The community was their life source. It was not an accessory. The church was the believer's life source. They've been delivered from the world, so where else could they go? The church was a community where their life was one another. So to be excommunicated, how severe it was, Paul uses the terminology, turn him over to Satan. Because that's how severe it was to be excommunicated from your other brothers and sisters. Let me interject something. How many of us look at one another that way? How many of us, we look at one another, or we look at the body as being that severe in our life? That if I don't have my other brothers and sisters in my life, how can I even go on functioning? 
That's why he uses turn him over to the avenger. Turn him over to Satan. Excommunicate him. And hopefully he will come to his senses. Boy, that's a different way of looking at the church. Because that is how, how, how important the body was to believers. To be excommunicated, it was like a death sentence. How can I be cut off from my other brothers and sisters? This is my life. These are the ones that I spend time with. We eat together. We pray together. We worship together. We cry together. Your pain is my pain. Your burden is my burden. And to be living in open sin and I'm unrepentant. For the church now to say we have to excommunicate you. It was a death sentence. So that's why he uses the term, turn him over to Satan. Turn him over to the avenger. And again, I ask each of us, not only you, myself, do I view my brothers and sisters in that same way? Or do I just look at y'all as people who occupy chairs? Is that how we look at one another? We just come and occupy space for, for two hours? And after that, you, 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 you go to your life, I go to my life, once a week, we'll see one another and do life together, and that's it. Unfortunately, that's not how the church operated. As I said, the church is an identity. It's not how the community operated. They did life together. So to be cut off from that community, it was painful. And that's the point Paul is trying to communicate here. Let's continue to read. He says, I will, um, you're, uh, verse 5, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit, here's why you excommunicate him, so that his spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord. Hopefully he'll come to his senses. When he sees that his life source has been cut off because of his unrepentant sin, Hopefully, it'll make him repent. It's hard to read these texts. Because just in my few years of being on this earth, I look and I say, Lord, where is that? You know, I, I would love to hear. I remember as a young man reading the stories of revivals and, and, and seeing all of these Prominent evangelists and preachers and pastors being raised up way before my time. When my generation came along, my generation was on fire for God. But I believe that life, I'm watching life take its course. Even in my life, many people I grew up with are not serving the Lord anymore. The way they view church, I'm tired of church. It's like by coming to church, it's like I'm doing you a favor. That's my generation. I don't know what yours is like. But when I look at how it was, I, I, I see a change. And, and again, it's not, it, it's not it, I, I'm not hopeless, no. But I'm shedding light on something that I've witnessed because I believe the Spirit of God is saying the church must return to its identity. It must return. Because if not, the blood of the next generation will be on us. And the generation after them. And the generation after them. We must return to our identity. But I look around at times and I say, God, where is this? It's not a platform. It's not an assignment. It's not a work. It's an identity. You are my brother because of what Jesus has done. You are my sister because of what Jesus has done. That is what Jesus is teaching here. So Paul is coming from that understanding, and the believers there knew it. Boy, to be cut off from the body. It was painful. He goes on and says, 
Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Verse 7, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He says, I, verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world. He says, no, I'm not talking about the people who don't know Jesus. He's saying the people within the community of believers who are refusing, who are doing this and refusing to repent of it. Don't fellowship with them. He says, verse 10, not all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a person. So these are believers, not who have done these things, but who are practicing them. They're doing their, this is their lifestyle and they refuse to repent. He says, don't even fellowship with them. Because if you do, it'll contaminate the rest of the community. He goes on and says, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are the judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. But again, remember, he doesn't leave it there. He doesn't just say, no, stop fellowshipping with them. Remember what the purpose of cutting off fellowship was. It was hoping that they would come to their senses. And when they come to their senses and they have repented, they've had a change of lifestyle, a change of mind restored them. Does that make sense? So, this is an example of church discipline. This was dealing, this was a standard dealing with a specific issue. But this interpretation here, what's the standard for it? Does that standard apply to every church? Who enforces that standard as to whom the ban or whom to accept in? If that's what binding and loosing means, that interpretation is a faulty one. Let me give you the last one. The fourth interpretation of binding and loosing, again, that is out there, is that binding and loosing means that the disciples have the authority to forgive or not forgive sins. Binding and loosing, that interpretation says that the apostles, Peter, the apostles, they have the authority to forgive sins or not. And I'm going to show you the passage and we're going to end there because I'm right at time. I want to show you where this comes from. And you're going to see what I mean. Look at John chapter 20. Just quickly, please. John 20. And let's look at verse 19 to 23. John chapter 20, verse 19 to 23. All right, John 20, verse 19 to 23. Wait, am I at the right place? Where are we at? Verse 23. So look at verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. 
And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. That is where that understanding comes from. Because they say, well, Jesus here says it. Jesus is telling his disciples, whoever you forgive, their sins will be forgiven. And whomever you, you don't forgive, their sins will not be forgiven. Clearly, it says that right here in verse 23. Clearly. We, we all just read it. The problem is that verse will contradict what Jesus tells his disciples. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 to 26. Quickly, please. Matthew 5, verse 23 to 26. Look what Jesus says here. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, what does he say in verse 24? Leave your gift there before the altar and go first and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accusers hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Let me show you one more example. Matthew 6, verse 12 to 15. Matthew 6, verse 12 to 15. And forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Verse 14, for if you forgive others their trespass, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespass, neither will your Father forgive your trespass. Beloved, the understanding here is Jesus expected his disciples to forgive. That they did not need a special authority to forgive. He expected them to forgive. Why? Because they have been forgiven. So if the interpretation that binding and loosing is having the power to decide who is forgiven and who is not, it is incorrect. So if that's not the case, then what is John 20 referring to? What is John 20 verse 23 referring to? I just want to give you one more passage of scripture to make it make sense. Look at John 13 verse 20. John 13, verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever, can you read that part with me? Whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Just one more, one more, please, please, please. Luke chapter 10, verse 16. This is the opposite of this verse now. Luke chapter 10, verse 16. Luke 10, verse 16. The one who hears me and the one who rejects you, what, what do they do? They reject me and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So when Jesus is telling his disciples, you have the power essentially to forgive and to withhold forgiveness, he's not talking about, you, you, you don't have the power to forgive anyone of personal sins. He says, no, the one who accepts your message has the right for their sins to be forgiven. The one who rejects your message, their sins will not be forgiven. Because the one who accepts the message of Jesus, who he is, what he came to do, ultimately their sins will be forgiven if they receive that message of salvation. But the one who rejects the message of salvation, their sins will not be forgiven. So the sins being forgiven and not forgiven is not a personal matter. It's in returns to the message of the gospel being preached. Wherever the gospel is preached, those who receive it, their sins will be forgiven. Wherever the gospel is preached and those who reject it, what's the opposite? Their sins will not be forgiven. So the interpretation here of binding and loosen cannot be in regards to deciding who is forgiven and who is not because no man has the authority to do so. 
But in regards to the message we declare, when we declare the message of salvation, those who receive that message and say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge you. I'm a sinner. I acknowledge you were sent to be my sacrifice. Their sins will be forgiven. But the ones who reject that message, their sins will not be forgiven. Does that make sense? All right, I'm over time. So next week, we will now explain what actually binding and loosing is. Tonight we talked about what it's not, what the interpretations were. Let me see how well y'all were listening. Who can tell me the four interpretations? If you get it wrong, you ain't leaving church. We locking the doors. <laughs> so think, think, think before you raise your hand. Who can tell me what's one interpretation of what binding and loosing is? Oh, y'all being quiet now. Let me hear y'all. Shirley? Okay, so okay, so binding and loosing one false interpretation is that it pertains to the releasing someone from their vow. All right, that's one. We got three more. Come on now. Go ahead, brother. Okay, all right, excellent. Uh, binding and releasing, uh, 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 binding and 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 uh, uh, loosing a false interpretation is that the church is given the authority to excommunicate it, whomever it decides. Pastor Charles, and then I see Ch Shirley. Go ahead. <laughs> you give the last one because it's fresh in your mind. <laughs> okay, that 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 the, that the apostles have the power to forgive sin. All right, and we said no, that's not the case. The only, the only way that applies is that when the message of the gospel is proclaimed and a person receives it, their sins are forgiven. If they reject it, their sins are not forgiven. I saw Shirley and then Demi. Come on, last one. Who got it? Think twice or we're going to excommunicate you. <laughs> I'm just joking. Go ahead. And to interpret the scripture means what? To dictate what? Their behavior or their activities. All right, we, we, all right, we got some good students up in here. We got some good students. All right, any closing remarks? You say it for next week? Okay. All right, anybody else? Any closing remarks? All right, thank you all. Can you stand to your feet? Let me pray for you. You know, you can always tell which claps belong for man and which claps belong for Jesus. <laughs> that, that was a clap for man. <laughs> Y'all didn't come for man tonight. <laughs> we came to learn about Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can you lift your hands? Let me bless you, beloved. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord give you peace. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And before we leave, does anybody need prayer? Ed, you need prayer? Come on, let's pray. Oh, yeah, I see that cane. You need prayer, brother. I see it. Is, is that what it's for? Your leg? Yeah. Church, just stretch your hands towards Ed. The way we're going to pray... Just release the life of Jesus into his body. Come on, just release your faith. In the name of Jesus, Father, we release your life. We release your life inside of this body, in these knees, in this leg. Father, your word tells us by your stripes we are healed. Father, we command this leg and this knee to come in alignment in the name of Jesus. We take authority over any pain.
any affliction in this body and we speak healing right now. We speak healing right now in this body. We declare life in this body. We declare life in this body. In the name of Jesus, we declare restoration in this body. We command the cells to grow as they're designed to grow. In the name of Jesus, we release every form of pain from out of this body. We reject it from out of this body and we release the life of Jesus in this body, in this leg, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, beloved, thank you for coming tonight. Lord willing, we will see you Sunday. Before you leave, tell somebody, I better see you next week or they're going to find you. The church going to call you. You're going to get an email. Don't play around now. We got your address on file. <laughs>